Right, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I say, Master Zimmerman, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Peter Murray, I'm a past master of the architects. And uh, when I was master, we, we, we had one of the city planners uh, come and uh, talk to us uh, at the annual lecture. And I was amazed how many people went away afterwards, uh, quite familiar with the city, saying, I didn't realize planning worked like that. Now I understand about this tall building or that cluster or the walkie talkie, things like that. And understanding the way the, the city works is really important to us as a company. And so we're very pleased uh, tonight to have with us Julianne McLaughlin, who is the Executive Director of Environment in the city, which means that basically she looks after almost every piece of sort of physical kit uh, that sits in the uh, uh, city, as well as uh, uh, 800 uh, members of staff. So it's, it's a big, big city department. And it's a very important job at the moment. Uh, the uh, city you know, is a business centre and as a community is facing its uh, biggest challenge really since the end of the blitz probably. And uh, Julianna's role uh, will be key to its future success just as Robert Hooke was in 1667 and Foreshaw and Abercrombie were in 1943. So really important uh, you're now in the city. No Julia. pressure. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> because, uh, well, Julia has got an excellent background in uh, town planning, economic development and regeneration, both in the public and private sectors, and both in the UK and Australia. And uh, she headed up the planning team at Hammersmith and Fulham, just at the time when they were going through huge change there. Uh, with the extension of Westfield, uh, BBC Television Centre, Earls Court, Imperial College, White City Campus, and uh, a new town hall, which is just under construction now uh, by RSHP Architects. And after that, she went to City Hall, uh, where she was Chief Planner to the GLA, advising on the New London Plan for City Khan and the Strategic Development, Shaping London's Housing, Transport, Environment, and culture. So uh, she's arrived at the, or she arrived at the city just as it was going through a major organizational shakeup. The impacts of COVID were becoming apparent and new policies were being developed to respond to the changes in the way people work in the, in the square mile. And uh, the, the very energetic and recently elected policy chair, uh, Chris Haywood, uh, outline a package of measures designed to boost the vibrancy of the square mile and to drive forward its recovery from the pandemic and also to increase its attractiveness to talent, which is essential for its business message. So this revisioning branded Destination City uh, will enhance the square mile's leisure offer as well as its commercial office, office, offer. And uh, you know, Julia is looking after those sort of changes at the same time as updating the local plan, which need to respond to the new London plan, which is a plan which Julia Emma wrote herself anyway. <laughs> so she's making sure that the city conforms to uh, her ideas about the uh, changing nature of the city. So, and we're very pleased, particularly at the uh, Worship Company Chartered Architects and the Temple Bar Trust uh, to be recipients of a very generous grant actually from the uh, uh, SIL uh, Community Infrastructure Levy, the SIL Neighbourhood Fund, uh, which uh, supports our education programme in uh, Temple Bar. So uh, we're very pleased to support the idea about Destination City as, because we're, we're branding Temple Bar, taking it back to what it was at the gateway to the city. So it's not quite in the same place it was it, when Sir Christopher went first built it, but it is the way that a lot of people, visitors to the city, enter the square mile from St Paul's, coming over the river from the Tate, and they come through Temple Bar. So we're going to be there uh, welcoming them and actually bringing Temple Bar back into civic use, both in terms of a place to dine, a hall for the company, as well as a place where visitors can come in and have a look at it. So these are, these are challenging, uh, but also exciting times in the, uh, as we sort of shape the city for the future. And uh, we're very lucky to have someone, um, as, as, as you'll hear now, uh, of such passion and expertise to be driving the changes. So, Julia, welcome and over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you. I just want to start with some thanks. Thank you so much for inviting me here this evening. And when I was thinking about what to talk to you about, I decided actually to take inspiration from your motto, which of course you will know is firmness, commodity and delight, and comes to us from Sir Henry Watton. And he advises us, the end is to build well. So this evening, I'm going to talk to you about how I think the city is going about its business to build well for the future. I'm going to share some examples from what my department's doing right now, to build a great framework in readiness for the challenges ahead, but also to share some of the innovative thinking and the programs that we're delivering to make a difference. I want to start with some of the here and now though, because a lot, a lot of people think oh, doom and gloom, but I'm gonna share some, you know, some stats, which I think are, are worth being proud of and positive about. So the latest city activity, we're at about two thirds of our pre-pandemic footprint footfall and the underground activity is hovering at around 70 percent the city is outperforming new york and hong kong on nearly all metrics and the planning and transportation committee last year was very very busy they delivered over 423,000 square meters of flexible office floor space including affordable workspace 8,400 of flexible retail 7,000 of community skills, training, education, and cultural space, two relocated and reimagined and enhanced public houses, seven new pedestrian routes, which were focusing on the city landmarks and improving pedestrian permeability and connectivity. And all of the schemes increased ground floor public realm significantly over the existing. We've also got three. Um, three free to visit, get my teeth in, um, elevated public roof terraces, gardens and galleries open seven days a week. And we've delivered over 7,000 long and short stay cycle. And all of the major schemes have all got um, consolidation. So we haven't got morning um, and lunchtime peaks for our vehicle deliveries. The schemes have all been targeting Briam outstanding, or those Briam excellence, and we've seen the restoration of four listed buildings, to in, including public access and heritage interpretation. So all in all, 34 major developments were granted last year and contributed over 148 million in section 106 and SIL. 11 of that for affordable housing, eight of that for carbon offsetting, four of that for local skills and job brokerage, one and a half for street public realm and enhancements, 1.6 to security, uh, 41 to the city, uh, 41 million to the city sin, uh, um, infrastructure levy and 77 to the mayor's sill. So as you can see, the city is still busy building. And um, we have faced countless challenges in the past. So now it is time for us to think about what our audiences want from us. Um, as Peter said, I've only been in the role actually for 10 months so far, um, and I can tell you it's been quite a ride, um, but I thought I needed good foundations um, to build well. Um, so my immediate challenge set to me on day one was bring three departments into one to create the new environment department. So indeed that's now done and the new environment department was born on the 4th of April. Um, and it brought together the built environment, open spaces, port health and public protection. And as Peter said, it's the largest department in the organisation with close to 900 members of staff based at 25 different locations in the Square Mile and London and beyond. So the environment department now is more responsive, coordinated, very frontline focused set of services, hopefully in providing improved customer journey, more streamlined functions, and giving us the good foundations for the to be ready for the challenges we face ahead and we have got big challenges generational challenges with no easy solutions but we also have a generational opportunity to redefine the city and it's worth redefining because it's a city that we all love and want to safeguard for the future years to come so for the rest of the time i'm going to take you through some of the work we're doing on the city plan our key strategies, the innovative work we're doing, like suicide prevention, some of our heat and wind mapping, our air quality work. And then I'll show you some of the things that I think we are doing to weather the storm to make us more resilient and also to take a leading role. So the planning teams, 
um, have begun working on your new city plan. And that has to be innovative and it's got to have climate change at the heart of it. There's no easy answers anymore. So the plan is needing to work hard to address recovery health inequality across the city and work with colleagues and partners to tackle the wider causes of poor health, sustainably improving air quality, promoting recreational benefits of a healthy lifestyle and ensuring inclusive access to good quality open space and recreational opportunities. We'll also look at thermal comfort, wind effects, radiated light, suicide prevention, and we're producing guidance notes to make clear what public benefit means and looks like in the square mile. So we're ready to reset our city plan with city strategies that deal with how we will recover from the pandemic and deliver a successful environment for the city's diverse communities. So the City Corporation started its, its, um, its new plan um, and we received about 1500 comments on the draft that went out in March 20, uh, 2021. There were concerns about tall buildings, the impact of the pandemic on office and retail, the priority for net zero and the climate, city's climate action strategy and exploring further housing supply and the need for us to plan and address more inclusivity in a holistic way. So we've got an enhanced focus now on improving our engagement with stakeholders, that's residents, business and developers. Um, so we're redoing our statement of community involvement, which will um, look at how we consult on schemes, policies and strategies. We now have a dedicated engagement and partnership team um, that will be working with the business improvement district, and they're becoming quite a significant dynamic in the city. So I think that the current statement of community involvement is goes back to 2016, so it's old, really needs updated. And what we're looking at is how do we consult? What is the format? Is it in-person meetings? Is it seminars? How do we use data or technology? How do we use social media? And our ambition is to be inclusive and at the leading edge of consultation. I thought you might be interested in the timeline um, leading up to the consult consultation adoption for the new plan. So it's being refined to reflect the current issues raised at the consultation. We've got greater emphasis, in, uh, emphasis <coughs> on inclusivity and accessibility and on climate change. And also looking at working patterns. So there'll be focused groups with um, business groups and liaison with uh, representative bodies, looking at the changing work patterns, hybrid and remote working, and also what is the flight path really to quality buildings in the right location. So we want to be able to consult on the plan in spring next year, have an examination late next year and adopt it in mid 2024. A partner in all of that is the transport plan. So that's being updated at the same time. So the two documents will come forward together. And our transport strategy sets out how we will propose to design and manage the city streets over the next 25 years. Ensuring the square mile remains a great place to live, work, study and visit. So our vision, which I'll briefly unpick for you now, um, we want our streets to inspire for the city to be known as a place of high quality public realm with innovative approaches to creating more people friendly streets. And this can play a part in attracting talent, investment and visitors. We also want the day to day experience of using our streets to be as enjoyable as possible. The walk from the tube to your desk, for example, should be a great street. And we want to capitalise on our world class connections recently boosted by the Elizabeth Line Force. And we want the city to be accessible. All our streets, transport networks must, must be inclusive environments where we feel everyone will feel comfortable and safe and confident when they're travelling. So the vision to achieve the strategy includes some ambitious proposals. So the prior prioritising the need for people to walk and make the streets more accessible, making more efficient and effective use of our street spaces, significantly reducing motor traffic, including the number of deliveries and servicing. Eliminating death and serious injury from our streets must be an essential part of delivering safer streets and reduces, reduced speeds. And also how we choose to make cycle conditions for cycling in the square mile far more pleasant. And of course, this all means we have better air quality and reduced noise, which is encouraging us to switch to zero emission capable vehicles. These are important proposals, 
Um, and they're important when this strategy was first developed in 2019 and published. They remain, they remain relevant now, but we have to update all of this. So we're going to be looking at quality high streets and public spaces as a key part of the city's offer for residents, workers and businesses and visitors. And we must move quickly to deliver a more healthy and inclusive environment for all. So the first phase was the pedestrian priority programme, which is going to be focusing on retaining some of the changes we delivered through the COVID-19 response. And this has the potential to deliver the transport strategies aspirations and climate action quite quickly. Um, so the experimental traffic orders that we've got, we've got some on Cheapside, on Threadneedle Street, Old Broad Street, King Street, King William Street and Old Jewry, and Chancery Lane is soon to follow shortly. These measures are to be retained on an experimental basis in the, in the first instance, providing some opportunity for consultation and monitoring and thinking about how we make permanent changes. We expect to begin construction at, at all change at bank project in the autumn. And the this will further improve the experience of walking around bank junction, closing some of the arms to motor traffic and widening the pavements and reducing the width of crossing. So we do think this is a really important project for the heart of the city. We're also going to consult on the um, on Beach Street to introduce a permanent zero emission street there, um, and that that experimental scheme ended in September last year. So we will be restricting the use to zero emission capable vehicles, which will really is significantly improve the air quality. And I think we saw that throughout the pandemic. And of course, now vehicles have gone back through there. Air quality is significantly eroded again. So it's the right thing for us to do. But we want to make sure that we are supporting that by enabling the switch to providing infrastructure charging. And hopefully today, um, the final checks on our rapid charging hub in Baynard's House car park have been done and we'll have opened six rapid charges with a further four to follow. So cleaner vehicles are part of the answer overall. So we want to see a reduction in the number of motor vehicles using all types of our streets. Our aim is a 50% reduction by 2044, which would replicate the reduction we've seen over the last 20 years, shown on the bottom line of the graph. You'll also see drops in traffic have tended to coincide with major policy interventions, such as the introduction of the congestion charge or global events such as the global recession in 2008. It remains to be seen what the long-term impact of the pandemic will be on our traffic levels, but we expect to see sustained drop as we have previously. And I'm delighted to see that the Mayor and TfL are consulting on looking at the next generation of what road, to, road charger using is going to look like, and we hope that will be a success. You'll also note on the graph, there's a significant growth in people cycling over the same period of time, something we're keen to make sure becomes an absolutely essential part of our, our streets, making it a safer and more attractive place to cycle. So new technologies um, are also um, going to play a key role. So we're part of the e-scooter pilot um, and we're working really closely with TfL and London councils to see if this is an appropriate and safe way for us to allow people to get around the square mile. So that one's still ongoing and we'll, we'll see what happens with that one. Um, the city streets also provide a backdrop to everyday life in the city, but it's also a great place for events that bring fun and some playfulness. So a more active role in curating activities and placemaking is something that we really want to do to support the city's ongoing recovery. And we'll be working with the city's bids and others to support the streets um, how they evolve and what they do with Culture Mile and how that relates to our residents, workers and, vis and visitors. But I'll say more on bids in a moment. I'm going to move on to our lighting strategy. Yes, I am. <laughs> so moving on to our innovative lighting strategy. This is the first borough-wide strategy in London and it provides a full flexible control of LED lights. This strategy looks at a shift in thinking about celebrating the balance between light and darkness. Brightness is not always necessarily the best. So thanks to remotely operated lighting, we're going to be complementing how our, histor our historic buildings look and providing the right light in the right place at the right time, improving our energy uses and also helping tackle light pollution. 
but it also improves the environmental impact and, uh, and light and health and well-being, and also protects actually the wildlife that lives in the city as well without compromising safety and security. So the strategy is going to be looking at light qualities, intensity, color, scale, darkness, verticality, and balance. It also provides some key recommendations regarding technical fun functionality and environmental requirements. So the strategy is based upon character areas. The city is made up of a series of character areas, each with the distinct attributes and contributes to the experience of being in different parts of the city. So we're going to be looking to accentuate and celebrate the unique qualities of each of the areas, maintaining some distinction after dark to help avoid homogeneity and enhance people's experience of the public realm at night. So we've got um, 12 character um, areas identified. This one is Culture Mile. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Um, so uh, Culture Mile, as you will probably know, is a learning um, and destination cultural district that stretches from Farringdon to Moorgate. So this is an example of the sort of things we're thinking about uh, working with local businesses to create the sort of uh, special lighting event that will make places interesting and, um, and attractive to visit. Um, so it's a, if this one's a, a, work, a, a working, um, a worked up version of what we're hoping to be able to deliver sometime in the autumn. And then this one is actually um, a little bit of a, a sneak peek of what we're hoping to do with St Paul. So we've obviously delivered some innovative lighting um, strategies before, if you think about illuminated river. Um, so we're going to be replacing the 25 year old lighting system that's currently at St Paul's with a new energy efficient LED scene. You probably noticed uh, in the winter, you really don't see the dome lit very well at all now, um, uh, which is terrible because we're coming to the 300 years of red. Um, so this new lighting scheme will enhance the cathedral's nighttime appearance and we'll build we will be delivering a 68 reduction in annual energy reduction in emissions, a 66% reduction in CO2 emissions. And it's really going to be um, superb when we get to see it um, all lit up like that. So the local plan also has a suite of supplementary documents um, and planning advice notes that offer additional guidance, most recently the suicide prevention guidance, which offers advice on incorporating suicide prevention measures into development schemes. The Vulnerable People Project and the Secure City Program is looking at leveraging state of art CCTV and video management capabilities by delivering a program that will specifically support vulnerable people and the city's bridges. This is actually an area that is, we, we, did a, we did a horizon scan to see what other cities did and what other bridges, bridge owners were doing. Um, and the work we're doing here seems to be a global first. So it will be secured through the Secure City um, programme, which is the three year programme that we're doing with the city police, the environment department and the city police together. And it's a groundbreaking area wide approach to delivering collective security for the city. And the goals of the city of this of the secure city program is to overhaul all, all of our really ancient infrastructure, resolve our end of life scalability issues, make a step change in situational awareness and emergency response capability, installing high definition 4K digital cameras in the public <coughs> realm and our bridges, and also implementing the first cloud based video management system that includes um, a machine learning video analytics functionality. Um, which we're really, really keen on. So I'm going to give you some showcase examples of sort of some of the things we're doing on city resilience. So I've mentioned the climate stra action strategy already. So complementing the local plan, um, the city's um, corporation's climate action strategy was adopted in October 2020. And we've got some tough goals. Net zero by 2027 for the city corporations operations, net zero by 2040 across the city corporations full value chain, and net zero by 2040 across the square mile, and climate resilience in our buildings and public spaces and infrastructure. So our strategy is going to be pushing the boundary and stretching the targets for carbon emissions and reductions. 
and also preparing the city to be ready for the climate risks because we're facing hotter, drier summers, wetter, windy withers, and more um, extreme weather events and the rise in sea levels. So we have identified six main risks, flooding, overheating, new emerging pests and diseases, water stress, biodiversity, mm. loss of disruption of food trade and infrastructure. The outer ring of the wheel shows some of the issues we need to address through our architecture and public realm. So the next slide outlines some of the work that we've been doing um, on our riverside strategy and provides a framework to ensure that the city remains safe from sea level rise. The flood defences need to rise roughly about a metre, um, and this obviously has implications for all of the riverside developments, which architects are going to need to address in their designs. The riverside strategy will require flood defences um, to be raised over the, over the coming decades, and the, develop the developments that come forward really need to look at integrating key benefits such as biodiversity enhancement and accessibility. We think that's going to be the key to the successful evolution of how the riverside moves forward to address climate risks. So even for our climate action strategy, the city was carrying out internationally groundbreaking work using com complex algorithms and data sets to enhance our understanding of microclimate qualities, resilience and comfort in our public spaces. Our work on thermal comfort combined data sets on climate, microclimate gain and holistic view. So you have a real feel of comfort in the city's public realm through the days and months and the seasons. And these are being used to inform planning decisions and policy. And we're keen to, be get, to get better at this, to understand how people ex experience heat, heat stress during the projected hot, hotter months due to climate change. So the data sets that have, we've merged are sun to ground and temperature humidity by, the seas, by using seasonal climate modeling. The other key data sets are wind um, and also um, how that will affect the winter months, whether, whether we have colder, colder stress um, sessions and also how the city will be resilient in, in, in hotter, much hotter um, summers. So there you can see the cooling effect of wind. So this is, um, you can see the city cluster there. Um, it's probably a good place to be um, in, the, in, the, in, the sun, in the summer because you've got cooler breezes. So this is a, a, a heat stress map on a hot summer's day in 2020. Um, it also, we've excluded tree cover from this. So we've got a baseline that we can understand. Um, you can see already there is significant heat stress, but the city cluster, as I said, does seem to um, be a, a more comfortable place to be. If we project forward to 2020, uh, 2020 2080, um, it reflects, this is reflecting the projected global temperature rise for, for London. And the heat stresses are really quite pronounced. Uh, the city cluster again is shadier, breezier in hot summers. When this is allowing us really to develop an understanding of what the tree planting strategy will be, how we deal with shading, shading and cooling initiatives and what we do. So also we're doing work with the British Geological um, Survey on uh, the cubic mile, which is about a mapping project which is below ground to help us identify where there are opportunities for climate resilient measures such as sustainable drainage, tree planting, cool spaces for refuge, increasing, um, increasing from our summer temperatures, but also it's assisting us with evolving our strategies about what public realm needs to do to be climate resilient. One of the other things that we that I did is when I came to the park was bring the gardens and the cleansing team together in a merger that enable us to tackle common issues. So maximizing resources, addressing antisocial behavior, fleet optimization, contract management, the maintenance of the street scene, utilizing of smart technology and data to resolve issues in a live environment. So our big belly bins, um, they actually push jobs to the cabs and they come and pick the bins up. So the bins are telling people when they're full. Um, we want to use this a lot more. We want to be able to use our mobile devices and different platforms to be able to manage the city in a better way. 
It's also particularly relevant the way the city has changed as a result of the pandemic. So we don't have predictable nine to fives anymore. So trying to manage a city and its needs has become a lot more challenging and a lot harder to predict. And I think flexible working patterns mean, you know, we're going to have to figure out how these peaks and troughs work. So we have got to plan in the live environment. Um, so having all of my services under one umbrella is really helpful. And it comes back to things like city gardens, commenting on planning applications when we use our climate data and our climate analysis. So we're planting trees that will cope with the heat of the city. It's also helping us deal with um, careful litter prevention and education. Uh, but we still think face-to-face -face engagement with our residents when we do um, tech take back events where you can drop off old electrical equipment um, and, um, and giveaway days where residents can donate and collect and use items. So we're really, we're really wanting to embrace, you know, the traditional, but also the modern. If I move on to some of the city initiatives that I think are leading the way. So the city is a place of business is more important than ever for driving our national economy. And it's being supported by the corporation services, hopefully to allow us to innovate and develop in new business areas, including tech and creative sectors. The new sectors will be a big focus for us. And we'll be encouraging the use of B grade floor space with our SMEs. How do we create a, a better, more supportive environment for, their, for SMEs to thrive and survive? And how, to they, how can they enjoy our quirkiness and help us grow as a city? So the four new bids are going to be key to this. And the autumn um, gives us probably another, another one um, with Culture Mile coming in. Um, so there's a lot of work going to be done with the, with the bids um, to make sure that we are spending our SIL money um, prioritising well and looking at what their strategies and their strategic priorities are. So Keith Bottomley um, is going to be chairing a new, um, a new uh, uh, um, strategic partnership with them. We had our first meeting and we talked about all the things that we wanted to do and collaborate together. Um, and a lot of that is putting emphasis around things like destination city, climate action, and some of the things that we really want to be able to do outside of the planning system. We don't want to have to always have the planning system as the answer to everything. It's got to be how do we work on these things together. And this is, shows you the, the city bid map. And it's only the Riverside now that actually doesn't have um, anything that's going to be covering it. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about was our, our Wi-Fi and 5G network. Um, so all of the physical network and the design um, is now pretty much there. And we've got, this is including all different users' needs, including the use of dark fiber. And we've got a pilot, um, which is uh, being delivered right now, which will be rolled out across the city. <coughs> so the city will be covered by 5G, which will support all of our smart city initiatives in the future. It's also important that we have minimal disruption for the city. So all parties, cabinet installations, ancient monument um, archaeologists, all of that will be done in tandem. So all of the permits secured means we have less disruption and the network is designed to factor in all of the upgrades. So we do that in a matter of weeks rather than months. Um, I'm just going to show you because you may not have noticed it. So these are some of the new 5G columns that are going. They're so new, they're still in the bubble wrap. Um, and they're on, they're on Queen Victoria Street. Um, uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be really important for things like Destination City. So circular economy next. I'm going to give you some examples of some of the things that the teams have been doing that is really quite inspiring and innovative. Um, so we're going to be replacing our waste strategy. That's a key priority. Our current waste strategy really only dealt with commercial waste and hasn't really looked at, um, sorry, domestic waste and hasn't really looked at commercial waste um, that's generated in the city. So the new strategy is going to have a much broader scope and we'll look at how we can ensure our own operations are being delivered and utilise circular economy principles. 
So the strategy is going to look at how we influence others, including um, circular economy statement feedback and encouraging the use of passports on materials and material exchanges through procurement in our supply chain. So this one is about some granite blocks. Um, and it's a really nice one, this one, actually. It's a part of the Thames Tidal Tunnel project. And the number of large outfall pipes were being constructed. This one was at Blackfriars Bridge. Um, and we looked at the removal of several hundred granite blocks up to a meter wide, weighing about a ton each. And some of them are actually architecturally significant. The team really wanted to find new uses for these. So we explored numerous avenues of cutting them up to use them as granite paving sets in the city. We've used salvage companies to place them on various building projects. And we've even harnessed lithium from them to make batteries. But we've also um, had several meetings with um, Thames Tideway. So they're going to end up, a lot of them are going to end up at Elmley Lake to reserve on the Isle of Sheffy. And they're going to be there to use sea defences, bird hides, and a visitor centre. So in June, we, draw, we published a draft planning advice note setting out really the more disciplined approach we want to see for the reuse of materials, retrofit rather than demolition, and considering the whole life carbon of a building. It's going to be a key priority for us. This one's true, but a bit of fun. Um, uniforms. The next example is about sustainable clothing for our outdoor staff. And the new, new uniforms are going to be made from plastic bottles. Um, they are recycled. They're made in factories using renewable energy and we recycle the old uniforms. So it's, it's, a, real, um, it's a real sort of cradle to grave um, way of us making sure that we're dealing with things. The next one um, is a project which came from a circular economy training a day that we were doing with our um, waste contractor Veolia. Um, and it was about recyclable materials. And they came up with the idea of using cans collected from city residents in the facade of buildings that sits up salt waste transfer station at Warbrook Wharf. Now, you might argue that a can should be recycled into a can uh, rather than a building facade. But this was really to think about how do you challenge what a traditional material is and how can we use things in a circular economy way? Um, this also will be hopefully this green wall will be fed by uh, city residents food waste, which will compost for the living wall. So destination city, how could I not touch on that? Um, so in September 20, the City Corporation Commission, an independent review um, on a renewed vision for the city. And it's really focusing on destination for workers, visitors and residents. And it really was a response to what do we do about COVID and counter the negativity and the impact that has really taken away the privacy of the square mile. So we consulted with 70 stakeholders and we came up with um, this, some key things that we wanted to be able to do. So we wanted to think about the city's identity an ambition for creating exceptional leisure offer anchored by the city's identity, building on its unique culture heritage, tradition, and bringing to life the incredible story and special character created through lots of experiences to a broader audience. We also wanted to have ambitious curated events program that deliver bold and exclusive popular must do events um, that all of the environment team will be there to support. We wanted to also have a new spirit of welcome. And this is about building on our city's communities um, and what we can do to support sporting activities and wellness, which isn't a typical approach. There's also going to be strategies to the public realm, and I showed you the, the lighting strategy about how we are going to be more playful, more car free, and certainly try and encourage retail and hospitality. We also want it to be a powerful voice for the city um, to show everyone in London and the world that we know that we have a relevance and a part to play um, in what the, how, how London recovers. So destination will be focusing on culture, hospitality, retail, sports and tourism. So the ambition there is to have 22 million visitors by 2025, increase the spend to 2.25 billion, 
um, and also foster much stronger strategic partnerships with city SMEs, businesses. So we are working on this collaboratively. So we've reached the topping out ceremony um, of, my, of my discussion with you this evening. Um, as you can see, it's been a busy 10 months and I hope I've given you a glimpse into sort of what has happened in the 10 months in, in, in my world and how I hope you agree we are planning to build well for the future of the City of London. I think we believe there are the signs of recovery, strikes and Southworth trains aside, um, and I think it's time for us to, to be positive about things. London is getting its buzz back, which is part of the appeal. Workers are returning in, in more and more numbers, and we do feel connected and strengthened, and we do want to see our businesses go on to strength to strength. So I think the message, the end message is not to be for us to be elitist or insular and for us to set the pace of being welcoming and broadening our appeal to make sure that we are attractive to the UK and international visitors. We don't want to be a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday location. We want to look after our SMEs, our bids, our young dynamic workforce, um, and also about our wider relevance to the UK. So this, this, always makes me smile when I think about London um, because I think it sums London up in such a, um, a superb way. London reminds me of a brain. It's similarly convoluted and circuitous. Lots of cities, especially American ones like New York and Chicago, are laid out on straight lines, like circuits of computer chips. There are lots of right angles in these cities, but London is a glorious mess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got time to take some questions. If there's any from the audience, it's probably some typed in online. Um, just to start with, we, we, there's a group of us that have been judging the City Building of the Year Award today. And according to Phil, we've done 15,000 steps. We started off in the, in the east, we went to the west and ended up down on the river, looking at seven new city buildings. and. Uh, just looking at the, 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 the picture on the wall here, London is constantly renewing itself and, and in, in my opinion, getting better and better. It, it was those 15,000 steps have been a really delight to walk around. The city is becoming more walkable and more pleasant, I think. So it's, it's great to, to hear that. Could you just say a few words about the hero events that were on your previous slide? What, what are they like? I can't, because if right. I do, I'll have to kill you. Uh, okay. um, uh, to be honest, they really are a big secret, but there is a, there is a big announcement coming mid-July, what all of the hero events are. Um, and um, I got a little taste of what they are um, just this morning, and they are really wow. They're really wow. They are. They're very good. Um, so you'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised and entertained. <laughs> now, there was a huge amount of detail in what you said um, this evening. Uh, one thing that struck me uh, quite forcibly, and that was the fear of flooding. Yes. And uh, I thought we were all looked after by the barrier and the successes to that barrier, which we presumably will be planning in due course. But, it would appear not. It would appear not. Yes, that that is the case. Um, I mean, there is another barrier uh, planned for, um, but it, all of our modelling has shown we really must raise that whole level, all that along that riverside, upper metre. Um, you know, we've got to do that in the coming decades. It's we're not, you know, in the immediate uh, danger of a tidal wave wiping London out. But it is we have got to plan for the resilience of. The future we still get in parts of London, sewer surcharging and difficulties um, there from um, from capacity for the sewer. But this is a threat from the river. Um, you know, we really have got quite low lying areas, and it would inundate and flood the city really quite rapidly if it did happen. So we have got to plan for that future. You didn't mention anything about Finsbury Circus. Is that still proceeding as one of the big? Yes, it will include the black top round the edge um, and they are um, so that there's that's actually still so we're, we're, we're thinking with our open spaces committee about 
We get lots of requests for how you can mark uh, or memorials for people. So we're starting to think about Finsbury Circus as a place for that. So first phase will be getting that uh, the, the, it delivered. And then what do we do with that blacktop around the edge? How do we have a place that we can um, have benches or other ways of marking, you know, think significant events or people often want benches. So it's a, that's a, that's a watch this space one. Uh, thank you very much. And what else of uh, things you're doing? And I think at the beginning you did mention affordable housing, but we didn't hear much more about that. Can you, can you say any more about that? I can. So, for the first time in a long time, the city is struggling with its five year land supply, um, and we, we haven't really got one, um, which does mean. <laughs> Uh, you know, writing a plan, that's a fundamental problem for soundness. So we have got to really look at affordable housing in, in a new way and reinvent what, where the right place for housing is in the city. Uh, we certainly don't want to have um, conflict between businesses and residents, uh, but equally, I think well, there's lessons to learn from places like New York, how you can live a successful urban life and then enjoy life there. So that's one of the things that is, um, it's a live problem for us. We've got to solve it to get us a, 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 um, a sound plan. And I am talking to as many housing developers as possible, encouraging them to look at how marvelous our city is. Is it all budgeted for over the next few years? Yep. Because this is the big talking point of developers I talk to, public authorities, yep. and everything that inflation is rising very rapidly and how we're all going to pay. It, it is indeed, and it's something that the, um, I mean, the executive team have a, um, a monthly check on this. I mean, the energy bills for the city alone went up five million pounds. That was it done you know with us not doing anything different that's why things like the lighting strategy and get on energy consumption really matter and getting that down but we've made a commitment to things like barbican renewal to destination city to the markets to to the museum of london and to some really key projects that over the next 15 <clears throat> years you know see the city spending even for the city, really quite eye-watering sums of money, and the city's borrowed for the first time. Um, so they are doing this to make sure these things are a success. So they're backing themselves to make sure that they, because they believe that these things will, will actually, will you know, will pay dividends in the future. So um, it's a, it's a careful plan that we are sticking to. But you're right. Costs are going up all the time. Things like the Guild Hall renewal and master plan. There's certainly we have to step back and say, are we doing this at the right time? But things that are about the recovery of the city and the future of our businesses and our small businesses, we've got to do that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. One of the we were on the tour of today uh, was the architectural awards, and one of the projects, first project we saw was um, involved plugging the building into the combined heat and power um, plant in the city around Smithfield and yep. this seemed a fantastic facility for providing virtuous power source yep. and heating. Um, and I wondered how much in the future the city is considering expanding that network, network yep. uh, to solve many of the ongoing problems. Yeah, they're, they're even looking at um, tunnels underneath the city um, and how we would use that. Um, because the you know when you go underground it's warm so they're looking at innovative ways of how do we use redundant infrastructure that's down there in a in a more resilient way so it's definitely something we are we are exploring um, some of our members are really keen to look at how do we offer cheaper energy for our smaller businesses so I think there's a you know there's a lot of ambition and a lot of um, a lot of blue sky thinking going into how do we give the city that competitive advantage and make us an attractive proposition, not just for big businesses, but for, for small businesses and for our city residents. You know, we don't want them to have spiraling, spiraling bills if we can take heat from under the ground into tunnels that are just there and are not being used. So there's lots of stuff we're, we're thinking about. Um. 
do you, do you, you obviously often monitor other world cities, places like Sydney have the vivid lighting competition every year where people are invited to, uh, you, you do sculpture in the city, which is fantastic, you know, really great initiative, but I can't say anything about the hero events, but other things, like just as delivery, delivery companies, yeah. we, we have lots of ceremonies. Yeah. Could we make more of those sorts I would, of things? I would love to. Some, someone asked me today, um, you know, if what would you want from destination cities to be a success? Um, uh, and, you know, you could use all the usual metrics, but for me it was, how do we get people to know more about the amazing churches we've got? Mm -hmm. How do we get people to know more about what the liveries have done? Because they are the foundation of why the city is here. How do we get people to know all about these wonderful little gardens we've got? And we often talk about, you know, the hidden city. Um, and I'd want it to be so well planned that you don't get to do it all in a day. You mm. know, it makes you hungry to want to see more of what is here and more of why you would be excited to come back here with your kids. And I don't want it to be so niche. I really want it to be something that is far more inclusive. And I think things like the um, Borealis lighting event that they did in the Guildhall Yard yeah. was, um, was a really good example of how that was a really sort of fun thing for kids and everyone, it was just superb. But I, I want us to build on really the the traditions of, of what made the city great and I think the liveries have got an amazing part to play in that you just have to look at how wonderful the buildings are um so I would hope they absolutely get involved do you want to go online the people online must be no, 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 no. Right. Um, anyway I want to pick up on that liveries because we're conscious of at least most of the ancient liveries are making things in their tradition. Mm -hmm. And many of them are making things now in very modern technological ways. Mm -hmm. When we walk around the city, we see those things represented in their old form on buildings. Um, many of the new buildings incorporate the new technologies, but it's not so self-evident. Yeah. And um, looking at ways in which the, the making capacities of deliveries become celebrated in the physical environment yeah. is, is something that I'm particularly championing on behalf of the company. Yeah, um, no, that would be brilliant. It would be, because I think it, it's good to celebrate, you know, where we've come from, but also showcase, you know, the, the brilliant innovation that goes on in the city. Um, you just have to look at some of our buildings, you know, they're not, they are, they're really wellness and communities, you know, they're not just an office with a, you know a cubicle desk anymore they're really quite how floor space is used is really change you know people might need to take uh will take similar floor space but they'll want a lot more leisure space or breakout space because you know we have a we have a very young population 62 percent of our working population are under 38 um you know when they come from the that sort of generation where they want everything now and it has to be brilliant and everything's got to be superb and you know dialed in and instagrammable so you know i think what we expect from this from city buildings is is, is completely transformed and the pandemic has sort of changed and pushed us on 10 20 years in the way we have to think about things and respond my question is partly for coming directly from a lecture by Tony Webb, who was the former master carver of St Paul's Cathedral, he's able to point to things on the cathedral yeah. and physically carved. Yeah. And it'd be nice to think that some of our under 38s yeah. working now will be yeah. back in 20, 30, 40 years' yeah. time there. Yeah. Again, yeah. Children and so forth, and saying, and we contributed to that. That, that places people in the making of London. Mm. Um, and the cathedral has that wonderful room with all of the burnt bits of the original oh, St Paul's. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's you know, the, the Fire of London is on every child's curricula in school. So that would be an amazing thing for young kids to go and see, because you actually can see how hot it got because the stones are so scorched. So it's things like that have to play part of Destination City and celebrating how brilliant, you know, an asset St Paul's is and brings things to life. Uh, could you say something about the um, e-scooters and e-bikes and what's the 
what's the likely time scale when that conclusion to the study is it, does it have to be done in conjunction with the GLA and wider or is it something the city can it is it's in conjunction with the GLA and London councils right. um and you know that's not to say we haven't had accidents with e-scooters completely mowing down pedestrians and you know not reusing things responsibly so um I think that's why I said they might be part of our future um and what that you know what that future looks like you know we might have flying cars before they're safe but um you know we we just need to we need to figure out how long that and I think the tr I think it's got another I could be wrong on this but I think it's got another six months ish to run before they they start looking at at whether it's something that they'd roll out. I actually saw two people on one in the Did you? It has to have, yeah. You yeah. know, no helmets. Sorry, I have a question. Going back to that, the um, affordable housing yeah. program for the city, had the city considered looking at the edge, edges of the city where it kisses um, with other boroughs, such as yep. Tower Hamlet or Hackney? Yep. Or yeah, uh, as is Linton, definitely a, other uh, sites to collaborate to expand. Yeah, um, I have, and I've even had conversations with the government because the city has huge land holdings outside of the square mile. So mm. a lot of the open spaces sites, you know, we've got four thousand five hundred hectares of open spaces, and not all of that is highly protected or charity land. Um, so, you know, I've had conversations about the government where I can build you lots of houses lots of them and they'll be superb quality there'll be architectural gems and we'll all be proud of them but i would like the credit for having those built um you know because it's something that the city will be doing and paying for um and they rather disappointingly said well it's the other boroughs who will be facilitating that through their planning process um so stalemate but i'll work on them Yeah. And do you foresee um, more trees being brought into the city? Uh, and I appreciate, of course, that uh, uh, pavements are, are quite narrow, mm -hmm. but um, I think with those wonderful large planters, mm -hmm. uh, I just wonder if there's a plan to bring more of those into the city over the next Absol year. Absolutely, and that was part of why we wanted to do the cubic mile as well because we wanted to know what was under the ground where we can plant trees that will withstand wind you know and, and make sure we've got really good root systems but equally <coughs> we can go into planter boxes what can we do the city does have to get greener um, just looking at you know the, the the heat maps of what um but there's there's a there's a, the national and international tree shortage at the minute you cannot get trees unless you're growing them yourself um, we were trying to get a tree for the Lord Mayor to plant for the Jubilee, um, you know, and it was um, it was incredibly difficult because you just it's one of these strange things where you would have thought there'd be a tree shortage. But um, so we started growing our own trees again. Excellent. Thank you. Um, could you say something about the three departments you brought together, what they were, and what that's involved? Yes, so um, so the three departments were the traditional built environment departments. So that was your planning, building control, engineers, um, highways, uh, transport. Um, so that was all, all that, that was one department. Then it's all of the port health um, and public protection. So that's your food safety standards. Um, it's all of um, the animal reception center out at Heathrow. I never knew I'd be looking after an animal reception centre that has a crocodile. Um, and we saw it yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, 101, 151 miles of the tidal Thames. Um, so all of the port health. So we're responsible for when Brexit finally comes, all of the measures that we will do for safety checks and all of the things there. So that's a real transition area where we, you know, you could throw the balls up in the air and see where they land and they'll be different the next day so that's that's an area that we don't haven't really got a full handle on yet and I think if the government were realistic they haven't either um, but there's also all of the open spaces so that's our Hampstead Heath uh, we've got reservoirs um, there's Epping Forest there's the Commons Burning Beaches it's a vast vast department um, you know with huge risk profiles from 
you know, how do you make sure you've got safe reservoirs and, you know, all sorts of different, um, you know, have houses and um, it, it's just a, it is a, it's a vast, vast department that um, um, is more or less the entire local authority minus um, housing and children's services. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Turn on to the door. No, I know I wasn't <laughs> expecting to do a restructure quite so quickly, but it was part of my probation. <laughs> Any last questions? Yeah. Um, it was interesting today when we did city building of the year because three out of the six buildings we went to see, which were, we were shortlisted by the city for us to go and have a look mm -hmm. at, were hotels. And that is very strange in the context that a few years ago there were hardly any hotels You're absolutely at right. all. So we're up to 50% of the buildings we were looking at today were hotels. Um, and the, the 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 pandemic had a huge effect mm. on tourism and so on. Mm. And you've talked about the number of people coming back into the city, workers within yep. the city, say seventy percent or whatever you said. What's what what's the figure on tourism and how do you see that impacting on the built environment of the city? For instance, would there be more hotels, etc. etc. There, there are, I think we've got five hotels in Priap right now. So, um, you know, so I think, you know, they, there's the, the, you know, I think there's definitely a gap in the market or they see that as a gap in the market. And we've also had, you know, a lot more, um, a lot more uh, student accommodation as well. So it, it's the city's almost reinventing and changing yeah. itself again. Some really powerful, big applications in Priap around Liverpool Street Station, what happens at Poddle Dock. So these are, it's at, it's at that point in time where we, we do sort of shift and change. Um, and we've just got to make sure we get it right. Well, thank you very much. You're most uh, welcome. Fantastic. Fantastic presentation and very reassuring that citizen safe hands <laughs> continue to grow and prosper. Thank, Thank you very much. I've been mean, told to tell you that there's a bar next door and we want all face corners for drink. <laughs> That scratched the surface, really. <laughs> 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.